Welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. I am so excited to be back here with you all. This is the first time that we skipped one week of webinars, so it feels like it's been forever. Welcome, everybody. Happy, happy Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about unlearning biases about ADHD and early childhood education. As you settle in, get on the Zoom link here. Go ahead and post in the chat where you're joining us from today. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, Stacy. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome, everybody. Happy holidays. Who has a holiday break coming up? Does anyone's childcare center close down for one week? Maybe you're lucky you get two. Maybe you don't get any closed days except for the actual holidays. Welcome everybody. As always, we're just gonna take a few minutes here. We are gonna let everybody who registered settle in, find that Zoom link, grab some water, coffee, tea, and we'll get started in four minutes. Welcome. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. We had over 2000 members of the early childhood community register to be here today. So go ahead and say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. Let us know what you have going on this holiday season. Dana, your center's closed for two weeks. That's amazing. That is some well-deserved time. Welcome everybody. If you just popped in again, my name's Maddie. I will be your host of today's webinar. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Welcome everybody. I can get so caught up watching this chat where everybody is joining from. I personally am here in Toronto, in Canada. So I love seeing where everybody's coming from. We are going to get started in about two and a half minutes. I'm very, very excited about today's presentation. Thank you so much to everyone who's just popping in. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about unlearning biases about ADHD and early childhood education. Welcome, welcome Elsa, Viola. Thank you for being here. I hope everybody is having a fabulous Thursday at your center. I hope you can find a quiet spot to be here with us for this next hour. I know if you're at your child care center right now, that is probably quite hard to find. Hi, Link from Toronto as well. <laughs> maximize our full hour together. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here again. My name is Maddie and I'm so excited to spend the next hour with you. 
we are here today learning about how to unlearn biases about ADHD and early childhood education. Quick reminder, every single one of you who is here right now, so all of you in the chat here, all of you online with us, you've automatically been entered for a chance to win our $50 gift card. So keep an eye out for that show notes email that we're going to send early next week. We will be announcing the winner right in that email, but also know if you are the winner, we will contact you directly. So you don't have to worry about getting a in contact with us, but keep an eye out for that email because the winner has to be one of you on here. So very exciting. As always, a quick disclaimer before we get started, the content that we are sharing with you today is not personalized legal or financial advice for you or for your center. So the goal today is for us to come together as, as a community of early childhood professionals so you can gain some really great tips, tricks, and techniques for your center, for your classrooms, for your home, wherever it may be. But if you are looking at making any big changes at your center, we do just want to make sure that you're contacting the right people who can help you with those changes, such as a legal or a financial advisor. We're now going to give a listen to our Lance acknowledgement. Hi Mama acknowledges that our main headquarters is situated in Toronto, Ontario on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto itself is a word that originates from the Mohawk word Takaranto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing. As participants and guests in today's webinar, we are coming together from many different places around the world. We encourage you to learn about and acknowledge the land from which you participate. And we are now going to give a listen to our diversity and inclusion statement. Oops. Hi Mama is committed to fostering an inclusive and welcoming environment for our employees, customers, and community. Hi Mama welcomes and celebrates individuals of all backgrounds, orientations, and identities. Our Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee aims to ensure we provide a safe environment for everyone to thrive while bringing their authentic selves to work. Our mission is to promote an inclusive workspace for all employees through education, discussion, and celebration of our differences. Embracing these differences while coming together with a common purpose is what makes our team extra special. Okay, and as always, before we dive in, a few housekeeping pieces. So we are recording today's session. As always, if anything comes up for any reason at all, you have to hop off early. Maybe you just want to watch it again, share with your colleagues, share with your staff. We are recording and we will be sending out the recording by early next week. We are also recording with the closed captions enabled. Though if you do require those for today's live session and you can't see them on your screen right now, just make sure you hit the CC button that's on your side of the Zoom so you can utilize those today. Uh, certificate, excuse me, we are sending out the certificate to all of you on here by early next week. So just keep an eye out in your email for that. These certificates can and end up in your spam, your junk, promotion, socials. There are so many folders in our emails now. So just make sure you check those in case it's hiding in there. And last thing, connection. If you're having any issue at all with your Zoom, if you're having issues with the video, if you're having issues with the sound, we just want to make sure that you're contacting the right people who can help you. Nora just posted a link in the chat that would be the support team at Zoom. You can contact them at support.zoom.us and they can help you figure out what might be going on. Okay, and really quickly, if this topic today interests you and you're interested in learning more about unlearning biases about ADHD in early childhood education, we have a brand new course in our Hi Mama Academy platform that is called Teaching to All Inclusive Practices, Inclusive Teaching Practices, sorry. And in this course, you will learn how to incorporate inclusivity into your teaching practices so you can create a better classroom environment for all the children that you care for. Uh, in case you haven't even heard about Hi Mama Academy yet, so to all of our new webinar guests today, it's our brand new online platform designed to give early childhood educators 
on-demand access to professional development training. We have more than 60 hours of ISAT accredited certified courses in here. So every course you take, you will get those CEU credits that you do need. And we have courses covering everything from moral development to supporting dual ling language learners. So if you struggle to find the time for professional development, if you find it really hard to get all your staff together because they're all working different shifts, Hi Mama Academy is for you because your educators can access it anytime, anywhere. They can pause, they can pick it up again later, and they can also pick the courses that interest them the most or that support their individual skill development. So it's really, really cool. If you would like to access Hi Mama Academy for a free seven-day trial, just to check it out, see if you like the courses that are in there, see if it works for you and your educators. Nora has just posted a link in the chat and you can access Hi Mama Academy for free for seven days just to check it out. Okay, and finally, really quickly, your hosts. Again, my name's Maddie. I am your host of our Hi Mama Helps webinar series. I'm also a customer advocacy specialist here at Hi Mama. Uh, and I'm also one of the registered early childhood educators that we have here on the team. As always, I have my lovely co-host, Nora, with me today. Nora, welcome. What's going on with you today? Hi, Maddie. I'm, I'm so happy to be here today with all of you. Um, Not much. I think I'm going to go watch the Leafs game tonight with some of my friends. Um, But Ooh, yeah, fun. not much going on <laughs> today. Very exciting. Well, Nora, thanks for being here. Nora, as always, is in the chat for you all. So if you have any questions for us, go ahead and post them. If you have questions for our special guest, I do recommend you use that Q&A button. Those questions will get to me. So if we can use those during our Q&A session at the end, if we have time. Uh, if you post your questions into the chat, though, as you can see, the chat moves really, really quickly. So it is hard for us to grab them in time. So I definitely recommend using that Q&A function so we can see them. Okay, and finally, last but absolutely not least, our special, special guest, Monica Madison, director and founder of Bloom Behavior. Monica, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Monica, I'm so excited. I know you have an absolutely fabulous presentation lined up for us today, so I don't want to take up any more of this time. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'll put myself into the background. So this stage. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So yes, that's me. Um, today we're talking about um, the following kind of key points, the cliff notes of our session. We're learning that neurodiversity is an expected and natural variation in human brains, um, that our understanding of ADHD has really shifted from 80s, 90s into what we know today. Um, but with that shift, we have some unlearning to do um, based on these past stigmas and beliefs. The third thing we're mentioning is that ADHD learners are accommodated in our classrooms, um, especially in our early years and um, we really all benefit from their presence. Um, this chat, and I shared on my Instagram this morning, if you follow me there, this chat, we're really talking about breaking down those, um, that history of stigma so that you can become educators that best support neurodiverse learners. Um, so while I would love to dive deep into very specific strategies, um, that would be an entirely um, separate conversation, so to speak. Um, but for today, let me make sure I've got all my stuff up here properly. Okay, so we have to acknowledge that the past stigmas or the perceptions that we hold, or we might have even just been exposed to, um, currently affect our practice today. Even if we're not aware of it or necessarily acknowledging it, they're still there. An ADHD diagnosis is something that carries these past stigmas with it and they're quite heavy. We're gonna jump into what all of these stigmas are and what our current understanding is, what we know today of ADHD. Um, but before we do, I have to first clear up this kind of foundational piece of neurodiversity, this term. Um, I'm confident that you're all hearing this term more and more. And um, to be honest, my hope is that I get to a place where when I lecture, do a workshop, um, that I don't need to have an outline of neurodiversity at the beginning because we just all know what it is and is not. Um, kind of working my way out of a job <laughs> would be a dream. Um, 
but it's important to clarify what we mean when we say neurodiversity or neurodiverse learners. Typically, in my experience, educators use this term interchangeably with autism, right? They, they say a, a child is neurodiverse when they mean to say that that child is autistic and vice versa. Now, while autism is a type of neurodiversity for sure, and it's a commonly known one, there are many ways that learners can be neurodiverse. Um, and ADHD, autism, these are only samples of this kind of neurodiverse demographic. Um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, OCD, sensory processing, these are all types of neurodiversities. Um, so neurodiversity just right off the bat doesn't necessarily mean autistic and vice versa. There's lots of different ways a learner can be neurodiverse. Um, what we mean when we say this, that a learner is neurodiverse or neurodivergent, what we mean to say is that their brain, the way that they um, you know, process or take in process and make sense of information um, in their environment um, diverges from what we would consider to be a neurotypical brain. Neurotypical brains don't have a diagnostic label placed upon them um, and neurodiverse brains do. So like I said, these labels are many. If neurodiversity makes you think of autism, that isn't incorrect, it's just limited. Neurodiverse brains are ADHD, written output disorders, reading disorders, sensory processing, um, the list goes on and on. So with that kind of understanding, when it comes to neurodiversity, I want to be really clear that this distinction of you know, being neurotypical or being neurodiverse is not to say that one brain is better than the other. All brains are good brains. It's um, a neurodiverse brain is the expected and natural variation that we see in human life. It's not a flaw or a mistake. Um, it is just, uh, it's just different, that's all. And my favorite analogy to kind of put this into a more concrete perspective, because this idea of different brain types can be a little bit abstract, but my favorite analogy is really to um, link this idea of neurodiversity, the differences in our brains, with the idea of biodiversity, the differences that we see in plant life. Just as we have expected variations in plant life, we have expected variation in human life. And I like to use this example of this palm tree and a pine tree. And given that I'm from, you know, rainy coast of West BC, um, these two trees, if I planted them in my backyard, the palm tree and the pine tree would have very different experiences. For one, the pine tree would likely grow very well and I wouldn't really need to do a lot for it, right? I wouldn't really need to do anything for that tree to thrive in my current backyard environment. Now, the palm tree, if I wanted this tree to thrive in my backyard, I would need to help it out. I would need to provide adaptations in some way. Um, Maybe I need different soil or some kind of heat lamp or to cover it in the winter or snow. To be honest, I'm not sure, um, but I would need to help it to be successful in this environment. This isn't to say that the palm tree can't grow in my backyard, but rather it would be very effortful for it to see the same success as the pine tree. Um, it wouldn't be able to thrive without intentional and effortful support. Now, does this mean that the pine tree is more of a tree than the palm tree? Or is the pine tree considered a better tree? If the pine tree thrives in this environment, does it mean that this is the right way to be a tree? Of course not. If we were examining these two trees in isolation outside of the environments, no one could argue which one is more tree than the other or a better tree than the other. They're just variations um, of what it means to be a tree. And neurodiversity is really the same. We have differences and variations in our brains and we couldn't say in isolation, which brain is better than the other, um, which brain is the right way to be. They're just different. Um, the differences that we see 
the reason that we see struggle for neurodivergent learners is because they are like the palm tree trying to survive in my BC rainy environment. They are trying to survive and thrive in a society that's really created an environment that serves neurotypical needs. When you're thinking about the neurotypical needs of social interaction, of communication, of sensory processing and regulation, of routines and transitions, and how we present information to people, the environment that these neurodiverse brains have been placed in is not tailored to them. It's really tailored to that neurotypical brain. And that's why we end up with children requiring these levels of support, not because this is a, a flaw or an error, but because our environment isn't created to support them. And this kind of shift in thinking alone, this understanding of neurodiversity is going to encourage you to become more inclusive and intentional educators, um, just kind of at the foundation level. Now, if we consider ADHD, and we're keeping kind of in mind that idea of neurodiversity and the differences in human brains, ADHD is one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders. As a result, we regard it as kind of this commonly occurring variation. Um, research actually shows that, you know, statistics of it, in a class of 20 students, at least one child would meet criteria for ADHD and up to three children in that class would. So whether they are diagnosed or not, whether you know that they are or not, you are undoubtedly supporting at least one child who would meet criteria for this disorder. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I would know. If I was supporting a child with ADHD, I would already know, and I'm not. And I hope that it's true that you would know, um, that you would be aware of these children's needs. But in my experience, oftentimes we aren't aware, um, and we, we, we don't know that their support needs are a result of an ADHD diagnosis. And the reason for that is because the way that we're interpreting their behaviors or their engagement is stemming from this flawed um, and outdated perception or stigma of ADHD, which brings me to my next point. Did we know collectively as a group, did we know that ADHD as a disorder is classified into three different presentation styles? Three people can have an ADHD diagnosis and they can all meet criteria for an ADHD diagnosis, but this ADHD can look and feel very different for each of them. The impact of their diagnosis, the way that it affects them in their day-to-day -day life um, and their relationships can vary. Imagine with me for a minute what ADHD looks like. And you can actually close your eyes, I can't see you, so you don't need to be embarrassed. But if you actually close your eyes and just imagine and try to picture a child with ADHD, if you're trying to imagine what the student looks like, the behaviors that they might engage in, the energy level um, that you can envision, maybe the way the environment feels when they're present or absent. When you're imagining this, what you see is likely, and I'll take a guess, is likely a young boy that's very hyperactive and always on the go. He's probably very fidgety and off the walls, full of energy. And if that's what you pictured, you're not alone. The majority of us are going to have pictured that. Um, and while I'm not here to tell you that that's not what ADHD looks like and that it's wrong, um, because this is certainly what ADHD can look like, it's just incomplete. It's not incorrect. It's not incorrect imagination or visualization of this child. It's just incomplete. It's limited. It's only one of the three possibilities for ADHD, and it's really rooted in stigma. As I mentioned, we have three different presentation styles. Hyperactive, that's the one that usually comes to mind, the one that you likely just imagined now. And we also have a inattentive presentation and a combined presentation. The stigma here, when I say that, you know, our picture, our visualization of ADHD is incomplete and rooted in stigma, 
is that socially in our mind, ADHD looks a certain way. We see that young boy that can't sit still or is really impulsive. And we have to recognize that the stigma of how ADHD looks, not only does it exist, but we have to acknowledge that it impacts our support and our care. The perspective of the hyperactive boy being the picture of ADHD has led historically boys reportedly being diagnosed with ADHD three times more often than girls. And from these numbers, we draw our own conclusion, right? We say ADHD affects boys more often than girls. And as a result, that conclusion, that perception shapes our care. The support that we might give to a male child that we observe these behaviors from, um, the support that they receive, we might not consider giving to a female child with the same disorder, with the same diagnosis, because we haven't considered or widened our lens that ADHD can look different, that it can appear different in behaviors, that it can affect boys and girls, males and females. The danger here, and this statistic still remains, is that although boys are three times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, they are not three times more likely to have ADHD than girls. They are only more likely to be diagnosed as males are often more, they more closely fit this image of the hyperactive um, kind of can't sit still child. They are sent for more referrals because their behavior fits this picture in our mind. It kind of raises these red flags in our classrooms. This means that right from the beginning, from our perception of who requires support and who doesn't, we're unintentionally ignoring a population of females with ADHD because they don't really fit our expectation of what it should like. And we end up with, um, right now, we have a large population of adult females who are being given what we call late diagnoses in their 30s and 40s of ADHD after being misdiagnosed for years with something like anxiety. Um, ultimately, if we see a young girl that appears distracted or emotional or making careless mistakes or maybe is impulsive or too loud, we ultimately aren't flagging that as ADHD behaviors requiring support. And we might even jump to our own conclusions about this girl being maybe just lazy or unwilling or uncaring. Um, and this is where this uh, stigma really starts, right? Right from the beginning and who we view as requiring our support and not. So we have this limited kind of perspective of what ADHD looks like today. We think about that young boy um, that can't sit still, but the stigma that this diagnosis carries um, in the past is much deeper. Um, in the late like 50s, and this is going to be a very quick uh, little history lesson. In the late 50s, what we now know to be ADHD, we refer to as minimal brain dysfunction. I'm sure we're all aware that our language is super powerful, and you can probably imagine the perspective or the regard that was given to people that were considered to have minimal brain dysfunction. Into the 60s, again, flying through time here, physicians started prescribing stimulant medication for ADHD, like Ritalin. This was considered successful, um, but into the 70s and 80s, there was social concerns about drug use, drug abuse, and this idea of overprescription. And in response to this, physicians started um, you know, limiting the amount of prescriptions that they provided or providing a um, you know, a maximum refill. Like you could only be on this prescription for a um, set amount of time. Now, we know today that ADHD is a lifelong disability, and we know that it is a biological, chemical, brain-based disability. But during this time, even with a chemical treatment available, individuals um, were restricted in their effective treatment of their condition, um, or if they did receive treatment, it was only for a set time of a lifelong disability. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certainly individuals who overuse prescription medication, both then and now, um, but our perspective of ADHD at this time was that this, the treatment of this disorder was creating drug addicts. 
and that people were becoming addicted to their medication. And this created a, another layer of social stigma towards those that did treat their, their disorder with medication. In the 90s, again, jumping forward, in the 90s, there's a new perspective that emerged. Um, and we saw ADHD diagnoses jump. And you know the reason for that jump or that spike in diagnoses is closely mirrored with the um, spike that we saw in autism diagnoses. Um, ultimately, our diagnostic criteria widened and we had a better understanding of symptoms and impact. And we were able to diagnose individuals who, while they had always had ADHD, right? That's something that they're born with. They were previously missed or not diagnosed um, as a result of kind of this narrower net. Um, when we widen that net, we caught more people. Um, to be honest, that's also an entirely other conversation that I could probably speak two hours on alone, this perspective of the statistics at that time. Um, but for today, just considering the social perspective of ADHD and how we've gotten to where we are now, this time in the 90s and early 2000s, socially, we kind of all looked around and said, where are all these kids with ADHD coming from? Right? I, we didn't have this when I was a kid. We didn't have this when I was growing up. As a result of this you know, flawed understanding, we determined that ADHD must be overdiagnosed or it's not a real disorder, right? We didn't have all this ADHD when I was a kid, so it must not be real. Socially in you know, the 90s, 2000s, we kind of collectively decided that, you know what, no, it's not actually real. Even today, if you search hashtags on Instagram, you'll find the hashtag ADHD is real because some people still hold this belief. Some people still hold belief that, you know, ADHD isn't a real disorder, that medication is dangerous and bad and shouldn't be used. People perpetuated this narrative that ADHD behaviors are not the result of a disorder, right? If we're saying ADHD isn't real, then that means the unfavorable or unexpected behaviors we see aren't rooted in that disorder, but instead they're rooted in that child or in that person. And we, you know, kind of drew our own conclusions that these kids needed better sleep and to eat less sugar and less screen time to have more consequences or routine or boundaries. And all of that is really to say that these kids don't have a disorder. They're just choosing to act out or to disobey. Now, the reason that the timeline of the stigma is so heavy is because when you put it all together, we are kind of going from minimal brain dysfunction to drug addicts or drug abusers to fakers or just bad kids. And this, this kind of collection of stigma still follows this disorder today. And the danger is that whether we like it or not, whether we admit it or not, all of us listening today have you know, held these perspectives or at least experienced them at some point. Right? We might have heard as children ourselves, parents referring to kids as, you know, being bad or out of control or, um, you know, really shaming this idea of medication, um, you know, perpetuating and communicating that, you know, that child's just going to grow up addicted to, to medication um, or, you know, those parents really need to control their kid, and stop letting them manipulate them. If you graduated in the early 2000s, your entire school experience, daycare, peer groups, elementary, high school, your entire school experience was co-occurring at the same time of these kind of flawed social perspectives. Um, so it's not unreasonable that you would have heard, experienced, or even taken in some of that. And as we, absorb this, and it's hard not to, especially for children hearing and seeing these things, it takes this conscious unlearning and self-reflection as an adult and this critical mind, really, to filter through these perspectives and biases that we've kind of internalized today and find the real conclusions, the real research, the real understanding. The reason that this is so important and 
you know, I think ADHD is one of those things that, um, because it is so common, you have, if you don't have someone you know personally that has ADHD, you likely know someone that knows someone. It's common, we see it all the time. And the reason that it's important to do the self-reflection is because if we could just learn what's new about ADHD, what we know today about ADHD, if we could just learn the pro proper supports, then you know what's the point of going through this, you know, honestly difficult or sometimes uncomfortable period of self-critique and reflection. If we could just do that, then what's the point, right? If we could just learn how to properly support, then why do I need to kind of um, uncover all those past stigmas that I've absorbed. The reason being is that what we think about other people is kind of what they become. And this idea follows the same theory as the self-fulfilling prophecy, which um, is something I'm sure you've heard of. It's a psychological phenomenon that says what we think about ourselves um, affects our behavior, and then that behavior is going to reinforce our thoughts. Um, for example, if I think that I am terrible with children, you know, I say I am no good with children, I just don't know what to do, I'm so awkward, they don't like me. If I think those thoughts, then I'm going to, in my behavior, probably be very nervous and hesitant. And that nervous and hesitant behavior, in turn, is going to not um, facilitate a very engaging or positive uh, relationship or connection with a child. And as a result, I'm going to go, just as I thought, I'm no good with kids, right? I thought I was terrible with kids, so I was nervous and hesitant and didn't have a great experience managing or engaging with a child. And that experience reinforces my original thought of, I'm no good with kids. That's the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy. By the same trajectory, what we think about others is also what they become. What I think about somebody shapes how I engage with them. It changes how I act in my behavior towards them. And that person will read and interpret my behavior and come to their own conclusion about thoughts that they have about themselves and launch their own self-fulfilling prophecy. This is where the danger of not unlearning these biases really lies. If I have a child in my care with ADHD, and let's assume that I don't really know about ADHD, um, I'm not up to date and I haven't gone through this self-reflective piece. Um, the ideas from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, those are within me. I haven't been cr critical of them. I haven't unlearned them. I haven't made room for new information. So when I'm engaging with this child with ADHD in my care, and let's say that they impulsively push their peer, or maybe they emotionally have a big outburst, a big dysregulated moment, um, I might think to myself, wow, what a naughty child. ADHD isn't real. There wasn't all these diagnoses when I was a kid. This kid just needs mom and dad to, you know, discipline them more, to be more firm, to not allow them to always get their way, whatever I'm thinking. By thinking these thoughts, even if I don't vocalize them to the child, even if I don't say them out loud, it changes the way that I engage with that child. I might have less patience for that child. I might invalidate feelings during this big dysregulated upset. I might quickly jump to my own form of punishment, like using a strong tone or taking away an item or a privilege in response to this behavior. And when I do this, this child interprets my behavior just as it's presented to them. They think, wow, Miss Monica always gets mad at me. She's never like that with my friends. She must not like me. I must be bad. They then, launch their own self-fulfilling prophecy, right? They're thinking these thoughts. People don't like me, I must be bad, I'm unliked. And those thoughts launch their own self-fulfilling prophecy where they have behaviors that then reinforce those thoughts. And that entire scenario was really crafted by, because an educator lacked proper understanding because they hadn't considered the biases that they were carrying that led to those kind of knee-jerk reactions or thoughts. 
at the end of the day, if you don't have this foundation piece of understanding, if you haven't done this critique, you could be instructed in every support strategy for ADHD, but none of them would matter if your base perspective is still rooted in outdated stigmas. Um, the method that I encourage educators to follow in order to um, ensure that they're not facilitating um, this self-fulfilling prophecy um, and to ensure that they're not um, approaching from these um, previous stigmas or biases is something called praise. So on the right here, you'll see a breakdown of this model. It's a multi-step approach to ensure that we're critically checking in with biases and ensuring that we're working from an inclusive approach. Our research is really always changing and we have to ensure that we are changing with it. Now, while this is um, presented to you today for ADHD, it's really applicable for all diagnoses. Anytime that there's an unexpected um, behavior occurring, this um, model is effective. So the acronym PRAISE stands for the following. Um, and this is something that I've created and I teach to ECEs, EAs, classroom teachers, parents. It's kind of universal. The first is when you're confronted with an unexpected behavior, you have to pause and not react right away, right? You have to give yourself space and distance from maybe these internalized perspectives. The second is you have to reflect on your own kind of mental and emotional stability at this time. You have to ask yourself if you're capable of engaging with this behavior. Um, it's really unreasonable to assume a dysregulated adult to be able to help a dysregulated child to somehow co-regulate. Um, after, after which you're going to um, ask objective questions, which is where this, um, this piece of learning up-to-date information comes in. You want to ask, what am I observing right now? And how is it related to what I know about, in this case, ADHD? Why is it occurring? What needs have to be met for this child? We need to ensure that we are responding to behavior and to children, not just reacting to it. Afterwards, your response is going to be individualized. You have to have a unique and uh, relationship focused response. There can't just be a blanket approach for all children. The S is for skills, meaning if we know that behavior is communication, um, it's communicating something to us, then what skills does this child need in this moment, right? What could I teach moving forward to avoid this next time? Um, and the final piece is an environmental check-in, which makes sure that we're considering all aspects of neurodiversity, um, making sure that we are considering things like sensory processing, different routines, um, the various environmental factors that could become antecedents or precursors for behavior. If this sounds like a lot, to be honest, it is, but only at first. Once it becomes a learned practice for you, you'll find that you mentally can go through these steps almost, you know, the end ones simultaneously and quite quickly. But the point is that when you're actively engaging in a model like this, you are ensuring that you're always working with children from a complete understanding that you are and complete meaning an up-to-date understanding, not from you know, maybe what's ingrained in us from the past. You are ensuring that you're working with intention and care, that you are yourself in the right headspace to engage, and that the interaction you're having is up to date, and it's not going to be rooted in these past perspectives. Now, we've reviewed the stigmas of ADHD, and we've checked in kind of with that praise model. So I want to just quickly kind of fill you in about what we know today about ADHD, um, right outside of those past beliefs. Today, what we know about ADHD is that it is a brain-based neurodevelopmental lifelong disorder. It's a neurodivergent brain, much like autism, much like sensory processing, which means that it's not flawed, but requires environmental supports in order to be successful. We know that it's not a dysfunctioning brain, like we had claimed in the 50s. Um, it is common, it's expected. ADHD learners are very bright, creative, empathetic, passionate. We also know today that for people who choose to treat ADHD with stimulant medication, again, taken 
by a diagnosed ADHD individual is helpful. It's not harmful or addictive. This is a chemical treatment for a disorder with chemical origins. We also know today that ADHD is a very real disorder. And we know that things like a good sleep, adequate nutrition, and consistent routine are helpful for children with ADHD. It doesn't cause ADHD to not have those things in place. And putting them in place won't cure ADHD. It's beneficial, but it's not going to make or break whether this diagnosis um, meets criteria or not. These distinctions are important because the way that we perceive a disorder is going to shape how we support it, much like that self-fulfilling prophecy that I mentioned. If we believe that a disorder doesn't really exist or it's easily resolved by a good sleep and a home-cooked meal um, and maybe a parenting change, then this really removes the struggle of ADHD, the undesirable behaviors that we might see from ADHD, from being rooted in that disorder to instead being rooted in that child. And that creates and perpetuates an environment and a relationship of continuing blame and stigma. It further stigmatizes children when we really need to just be accepting and supporting them. We also know today that there are multiple presentations of ADHD and that these brains are supported with environmental concepts in our classroom, such as novelty, movement, and supports that remove distractions. I do want to draw your attention to these two images on the screen here. Um, on the image in the left, you can see the um, brain mapping, the differences between an ADHD brain that is seated still and expected to focus, and the same brain that is seated with fidgeting and allowed to focus. This is a reference for you that I want you to remember when you're working through that praise model. Requiring you know, a crisscross applesauce and quiet hands at circle time is not neurodiversity inclusive. We need to ask ourselves, going through those steps, if this child is fidgeting, what do I know about this in relationship to ADHD? We wanna work through those steps. Um, the interesting piece of this um, image that you see here is the comparison between the typical, the neurotypical brain on the far right of that white piece of um, imaging um, with the ADHD and fidgeting brain. When it comes to having to focus and attend to something, the ADHD brain that's allowed to move and fidget has the same or similar um, activity levels as a typical brain, whereas the ADHD brain that is required to sit still has decreased um, activity levels, meaning they are not very focused. So while they may look, you know, they might fit our expectation, again, this educator perspective and bias, they might fit our expectation of what being focused looks like internally in their brain, they're actually not. Likewise, the scan on the right is referring to ADHD brains that are um, taking and not taking medication. So when compared to the control neurotypical brain, a brain that doesn't have an ADHD diagnosis, the ADHD brain on medication, right, when an ADHD individual is taking medication, more closely mirrors the activity level of the control brain that's off of medication. Right? Medication brings the functioning and activity of an ADHD brain to almost typical levels. Likewise, the ADHD brain off of medication is more closely like the control brain on medication. Less activity is seen there. This is an important piece when we are considering our own ideas about medication and that kind of rooted fear of dependency, addiction, and creating high kids. Control brains, neurotypical brains who do not need medication may experience a high feeling as a result. But brains that require the medication do not. ADHD adults usually share that their medication doesn't make them feel high. It just allows them to focus on one task at a time. You can think of this relationship very similar to that of taking pain medication. If you have pain, the medication you take removes pain. It doesn't make you high though. If you continue taking pain when you don't have 
or if you continue taking pain medication when you don't have pain or you take more pain medication than what is required for your level of pain, you will experience other outcomes, such as potentially that high feeling. So you can think about it in kind of a similar sense. Okay, I mentioned that ADHD brains thrive in novelty, movement, and with this kind of multimodal approach to instruction, all of which are easily accommodated in our classroom spaces, really at any level, but especially in the early years level. I have entire other workshops that dive into these supports in more depth, you know, two hours only talking about supports and accommodations. Um, today, we're really just taking that first step of self-reflection to remove these biases so that we're in a position to absorb and then, you know, kind of make room in order to implement support in the future. With that said, the kind of biggest accommodation that holds all other accommodations within it, um, if I can only leave you with one, is really to identify and examine your own objective. When we critically check in with ourselves and identify the objective of what we are doing, why we are doing something with children, and we might refer to this as our pedagogical intention, but when we focus on the why behind our actions, our presentation of materials, our explanations, routines, physical environment, all of it. When we focus on the why in singularity, it allows us to explore all avenues of engagement and education through these ways, through novelty, through movement, through multimodal approaches. It's inherently more inclusive of neurodiversity because we're not getting stuck in how something should look or should be. We're allowing opportunity for variations and engagement of learning. For example, if I ask myself the objective behind running a circle time in my program, right? If I ask myself, why am I running circle? I could answer a multitude of ways. Maybe it's a transition time for me. Maybe it's just the way we've always done it. Maybe that's the time we have group discussion or we engage in a story or a book. Regardless of why I'm doing it, if I can pinpoint one of these, as my primary objective, then I allow room and almost permission for myself to meet that objective in many other ways. A child with ADHD might struggle to sit at circle time, um, to listen and focus on the book being shared or the discussion at hand, maybe to be in close proximity to others. They can struggle for many different reasons. But if I ask myself, why am I doing this circle, then the way that I am going to meet that why is able to shift. If my primary objective um, is to, let's say, have students attend to a story, right, if we're engaging in literacy, then I can meet that objective in many other ways. I could um, read a book during lunch hour um, or during outside sandbox play. Both of those new environments allow for novelty for a child with ADHD. They are naturally allowing for movement, whether they're eating or engaging in sensory play outside. Um, and they allow the freedom for how the child engages with listening. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, everybody seated in the same manner, still, you know, not touching each other, whatever. There's Kind of this limitless potential for how they could engage with listening to that story. I make my care and education inherently more inclusive when I not only recognize and let go of these previous biases that we've had, um, but when I ask myself, how can I accommodate neurodiversity? And the how is really rooted in the why. Why am I presenting this question? Why am I presenting this art project? how is my presentation of these materials not inclusive, right? What do I know about ADHD and how can I adapt my presentation in order to better support it? Um, the beauty of this approach of focusing kind of on the single objective of asking yourself, what's my pedagogical intent? What's my focus rooted in? The beauty of this is what we call universal design, meaning it benefits everybody. Even if I considered this presentation for only one student, the accessibility to it for all students is universally beneficial. Um, 
And that's just based on personalities, learning preferences and support needs, right? The same could be said here. If I said at the end of our talk today, you have to write me a four page paper about your past biases. Some of you might find that really easy to do and others would find that really daunting. But if my intention, if my objective is to make sure that we are engaging in self-reflection, if that's my objective, I could meet that in many different ways. I could say, provide me questions, you know, about your past biases, discuss in small groups, make a multimedia collage about, you know, your past perceptions of ADHD and your current ones, um, act out a scenario, um, you know, do the written assignment. If I present this, if I focus on one objective and it allows me to present this in multiple different ways, then everyone is able to engage in a way that's inclusive of their personalities, learning preferences, and support needs. Okay, I could likely talk for hours more, um, and I often do <laughs> on this subject, um, but I appreciate you um, giving a little bit of time to this kind of matter of these uh, past biases. Um, I'm sure that all listening are already striving to be intentional and inclusive care providers and engaging in talks like this really brings you even closer. I always say there's no one perfect way to be like the perfect educator, but if you can be intentional, then that's pretty close. So, okay. Thanks. Monica, thank you so, so much. That was such a fabulous, informative webinar that really got me thinking oh, yeah. as you're going through this presentation. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And as always, yeah. everyone, we're going to go through our quick questions of the day. Uh, so while I'm doing that, Monica, feel free to have a sip of water, catch your breath. That was a lot. Take a peek at the chat if you want, because there is a lot of really amazing feedback <laughs> uh, flying in there right now. So take a look in there, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll really quickly there. You should see it on your screen in just a couple of seconds. Uh, as always, we are curious to know, are you part of the Hi Mama family here at Hi Mama? Do you use Hi Mama at your center? Uh, how do you currently observe and document your children's develop developmental needs in your classroom? So how are you tracking all of those important developmental needs and observations? Uh, and then are you interested in a demo of Hi Mama Academy for you, for one of your staff, for all your staff? Um, again, you can access Hi Mama Academy for free for seven days. So you can check it out, see if it's for you. Um, and then the last one there, do you submit Hi Mama's webinar certificate? So the certificates that you get from these webinars on a weekly basis, uh, do you submit those to your local licensing agency for professional development hours? Do you just keep them for yourself? We are curious to know what happens with these, with these certificates that we send out on a weekly basis. So let us know in the polls there. I am going to go ahead and pull up some of those questions that came in. Okay. Okay, Monica, are you ready for just a couple questions before we wrap up for yeah, the day? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um it looks like there was quite a few questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put them in as one as best I can here. Okay. Just about when we should be or like when we most often start to notice signs. So the, mm -hmm. the question here is one, what is the earliest age that a child should, could be diagnosed and provided with medication. Um, and do you know how those young children, like a two-year-old, how they're diagnosed, like what the process is like? Yeah. Okay. So that is a, a big question. Um, and I do want to say that if there are other questions, I'm happy to accept them on my Instagram. Um, after the fact, or if something comes up later Amazing. and you didn't think of it now, then I'm happy to go in later and answer there. Um, okay, the earliest that a child could be diagnosed will vary by the practitioner and the level of um, impact or symptoms. So typically, typically speaking, children are diagnosed sometime between kindergarten, kindergarten and grade one. However, parents um, of children that do receive diagnosis have um, struggled in daycare and preschool and at home long before that. So they've seen the impact of um, this neurodiversity, you know, two years old, three years old, four years old. 
when it comes to medication, and again, I can only speak for, you know, my scope in BC here, typically children are not provided medication before the age of six. Um, and again, that will vary practitioner to practitioner and with um, different impact and severity levels. I have a client of mine that received medication when they were four, and I have a client that didn't receive medication until they were 10. So um, it really varies um, in that scope as well. Um, the, the things that you would maybe go, oh, that's maybe a red flag that are beyond our typical presentation, right? That hyperactive presentation where we've got tons of energy and we're fidgeting and always on the go. Um, what we often see is young children that are hyperactive in almost their thought, right? So they are young kids that are in preschool um, and they are constantly interrupting or they might have sensory, there's like this correlation between sensory processing and ADHD. So they might have hyper or hypo sensitivities to different sensory domains like tactile, auditory, or proprioceptive. So we see those. Um, sometimes uh, parents are, um, you know, they're struggling at home, maybe daycare or preschool needs more support. Um, where I am, we have support child development. That's a ministry organization that can offer support there. Um, and that can be great when it comes to the process of getting that diagnosis. Once we've left those early years and we're now in kindergarten grade one, um, that's usually done through making a appointment with your family physician and your family physician will do almost like a preliminary screening. And then based on that preliminary screening result, would send you a referral for a uh, developmental pediatrician, someone that is specific for ADHD or autism or sensory processing, whatever the outcome of that um, assessment might be. But first step would be um, family physician and requesting a referral to a developmental pediatrician. Okay, amazing, thank you, Monica. Um, I'm going to try and get this, this question in quickly before we have to wrap up. So for everybody else on here, if we did not get to your question, as Monica said, uh, we will be sharing how to stay in contact with Monica to learn more about bloom behavior in the show notes email that we send out. So just keep an eye out for that. But someone in the audience asked here, how do I support a child in my classroom with ADHD who is really upset? Are there any different strategies mm -hmm. to be used as opposed to a child who may not exhibit ADHD symptoms? Yeah, so often when we are faced with children that are having a dysregulated moment and they're neurotypical, often, you know, we can comfort them easily or resolve whatever the issue is, and then it's fine. You'll notice for children that are neurodiverse, if they're in this dysregulation and in this period of upset, even if you comfort them and resolve whatever the issue might be, the dysregulation and upset continues. And that's because it is not a... Um, necessarily like this communicative piece to, um, you know, get attention or get access to an item. It's truly this overwhelm of dysregulation. Um, based on the child, I found that um, engaging them in some type of sensory activity is helpful um, and that can help be a calming effect for them, but that would depend on the child. You know, some children really like these like deep pressure um, squeezes on their joints. Um, you'll see kind of support people doing that. And people often think it's in muscles, but it's not, it's this, um, proprioceptive sense and seeking this pressure in joints. So wrists, elbows, shoulders, like tight little squeezes, modeling, deep breathing for them, um, engaging them in like a sensory bin, um, noise canceling headphones, whatever their specific individualized need might be can help. Um, but just to kind of keep yourself regulated and know that this isn't a manipulation piece, this isn't a tactic, this is truly an overwhelm of dysregulation, and they need a regulated adult in order to help them through it. Right, absolutely. So it sounds like that first step there is, like you said earlier, making sure you have the capacity, otherwise yeah. it's not going to be successful. Yeah, that's right. And and then it also sounds like there are a variation of strategies that can be used, but for an educator on here who might be supporting a child with ADHD, it might be a bit of a trial and error process as we figure out what that specific child needs. Yeah, the, the best thing would be to prevent upset, right? So if you can map out what is happening right before the upset, right, the antecedents, and then 
resolve those so that we don't have an opportunity for the upset, then that's helpful. If transition right. in in the morning is an upset, then maybe we can have like a soft start. Maybe we right. invite mom to come in and stay for a bit. Um, maybe we set up their favorite activity right away so that they have something coming in. If, um, you know, not having access to an item is an upset, maybe we can remove that from our field of view so it's kind of more out of sight, out of mind. Um, or provide visual representations of, you know, what's coming up next. Um, right. Often having right. just these preliminary effect, uh, supports will be effective. Right. Absolutely. Monica, thank mm-hmm. you so, so much for all this information, for being here with us today and sharing all of that knowledge. Uh, this was an absolutely fabulous webinar, and I'm, I'm so glad we, we had you for this hour here today. So, Monica, thank you so much for being here with us, and we certainly hope to work with you again in the future. Yeah, happy to. Thanks so much, Monica. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Before we wrap up, everybody, really, really quickly, just a reminder, I saw a lot of questions about the slides. Those will be being sent out with the recording early next week. So just keep an eye in your email for that. Again, check your spam, check your junk. They do like to hide in those folders sometimes. And again, our very last webinar of 2022. Child care safety trends that you need to know for 2023. I'm super excited. It's next week, Thursday, December 15th. 2 p.m. Eastern time. We will be here. I hope you can make it. It is our last webinar of 2022. Very exciting. And a reminder about that giveaway. We will be announcing the winner in the show notes email with the slides, with the recording. So you're going to want to keep an eye out for it. If you are the winner, we will contact you. And lastly, if you have yet to connect with us on our social media platforms, please do. You can follow us on Instagram so you can stay up to date with what's going on with our webinars, what's coming up next. And we have a really fabulous circle time group for early childhood educators on Facebook where lots of really great ideas are being shared uh, for in the classroom. So it's a lot of fun in there. I hope you can check us out. Otherwise, thank you so much for spending time with us, for being here with us on this Thursday afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your week. And I hope to see you all for a very last webinar of 2022. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.